So finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce <laughs> Julian Dowd as well. After a very stressful night and early morning, uh, he is here. <laughs> Julian is a professor of physical geography at Cambridge University with a specialization in glaciology. But he is also the director of Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. He has a long history in polar regions. He has worked in the polar areas for more than 30 years, all over the Arctic, but also in the Antarctica. And he is one of the few, I think, that has also worked in the Russian Arctic. His main focus for several years was the form and flow of glaciers and ice caps in the Arctic and the impact of climate change on these ice bodies. And there are very few that has really studied the Russian Ar high Arctic but he has done that, flown all over the Russian Arctic, doing radar echo soundings of the glaciers and ice caps on the Russian archipelagos. So that's uh, one topic. Uh, but he started in the 80s when he did his PhD, and the PhD was on remote sensing of Svalbard glaciers. So he has also carried out fieldwork in Svalbard on the US for an ice cap. I think he spent at least a couple of weeks in a tent together with Trond Eiken, who's sitting here. We could tell stories about that, maybe we can do it later. But uh, since then, Julian has been extremely active. I think he has published more than 250 scientific papers and eight books. I don't know how it's possible. But anyway, that's how he has done. So anyone studying glaciers in the Arctic must have read some of Julian's papers. It covers a wide, really wide range. And he has been awarded several awards for his research. Maybe I should mention the Polar Medal by Her Majesty the Queen of England. And I should mention the Louis Agassiz Medal, which is awarded by the European Geophysical Union. So, that's nice. <laughs> Uh, as we recently heard, we heard the background, the, the discovery of the ice ages. So Julian has worked on, on the traces of the former ice sheets for many years, and he has switched a little bit from land-based glaciers to the former paleo ice sheets that also covered the ice shelves. And that, I think, is the main topic of his talk today, the marine geophysical signature of past ice sheets. So please, Julian. Thank you very much, Jan Uwe. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm delighted to have made it in the end. Um, o Oslo, I've, I've spent a lot of time in over the decades. I knew Jan Uwe when both of us were research students quite a long time ago. Now, somebody mentioned being over 60 is something of a problem. I hope it isn't. <laughs> um, I, I also should say, and I don't think either of them are here, but Anders Elverhoy of the geology department here and Anders Solheim, um, got me interested in marine geology and geophysics after I'd worked almost exclusively on glaciers and ice sheets for a number of years, uh, largely because I felt as though some of the numerical modelling that we were beginning to get into in the 1980s really, really needed to be tested against an independent observable record. And of course, I'm sure, speaking to geoscientists today, that all of you understand the pleasures of actually doing field work as well as applying it to numerical models and so on. And I think, uh, <coughs> you know, your Nuva mentioned that I've been lucky enough to travel quite widely in both polar regions, and it's been a huge privilege to do that as part of my scientific career. And I'm sure all of you will agree that, you know, field work is an important part still of what we all do. So, what is the marine geophysical signature of past ice sheets? That's what I want to talk about today. Firstly, what are the modern and quaternary limits of the effect of ice in the sea. Here we have the contemporary limit of the furthest travelled icebergs in the northern and southern hemisphere, because those icebergs, even though they're travelling long distances, even just to the south of New Zealand, and an odd iceberg is found off, off the South Island of New Zealand about every 10 years, those icebergs at the limit are still melting 
and drop stones are still being produced. And of course, as we go proximal to the ice, we find the imprint of glaciers and ice sheets much greater, particularly on the now um, um, abandoned continental shelves, which were at full glacial conditions almost everywhere on the globe, covered by ice. Um, and then we can see the full glacial limit here, coming down with iceberg plough marks on the continental shelf as far south as places like Florida in the Northern Hemisphere. So, Ice influences ocean sedimentation over about 20, 25, even 30% of the global ocean under full glacial conditions. But what do we understand about the marine geological and geo geophysical signature of past ice sheets? And equally, what, we don't, what don't we understand yet? We've done a lot of work using swath bathymetry and various acoustic profiling systems to try and outline the variety of submarine glacial landforms, those that are well preserved beneath the sea below wave base, and they really are well preserved, as I hope I shall show you. So we know something of the variety, and that variety can tell us about ice extent, it can tell us something about the dynamics of past ice sheet, it can tell us something about the retreat st style of ice sheets, and even be applied to the study of ancient rocks, such as the late Ordovician system of northern Africa, which is a glaciogenic sequence. But there's a lot we still need to know. What are the processes of genesis of these subglacial landforms that are so well preserved in the marine record? What are the rates of landform development, some of the big sedimentary wedges? How long do they take to form? What does that landform distribution mean for past environmental conditions? What landform distribution means for subglacial hydrology? Because, of course, today the hydrology of the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet is buried under about three kilometres of ice. It's difficult to observe directly. So what does the quaternary preserved record tell us about this? And also, we can see a lot concerning the complexity and the reorganisation of past ice sheets, which gives us a much bigger time window on what ice sheets are doing than the few scanty decades of satellite observations. So, firstly then, a little bit about the variety of submarine glacial landforms. And I'm going to talk about three scales of landform. First, individual landforms. Secondly, assemblages of landforms. And thirdly, whole land systems. And I'll show you what I mean by each of those. Firstly, this is just an example of one individual land, a couple of individual landforms on, in this case, the Beaufort Shelf. And we can see beautiful iceberg plough marks here. In this case, the water is, very sh is relatively shallow, but they're still probably produced by icebergs rather than sea ice. And we can also see beautiful mud volcanoes, which are not of themselves, of course, of glacial origin. So these I would refer to as individual landforms, mud volcanoes and iceberg plough marks. And then we have assemblages of landforms, and this is swath bathymetry of two Spitsbergen fjords, where we can see very complex sets of landforms. The ice is here and here in part, two parts of Svalbard, and we can see streamlined landforms in the direction of past ice flow. We can see terminal moraine ridges, we can see beautiful debris flows coming off these ridges into deeper water, and we can see transverse to flow ridges of various degrees of subtlety. And we can put that together into a simple conceptual cartoon of the landform assemblage, in this case associated with surge-type glaciers surging into the marine environment in Svalbard. And you can see that there are up to five or six superimposed landforms which are produced during the active and then quiescent phase of the surge cycle. So that's what I mean by a landform assemblage. And thirdly, in terms of a whole fjord shelf slope system, this I think speaks for itself, where we look, in this case, from wet on west, west Greenland, right from fjord heads, where glaciers are draining huge interior basins of the Greenland ice sheet, through very deep fjords, out into the inner, the mid, and the outer shelf, and then where the mountains that eroded beneath the Greenland ice sheet finally meet their end in filling in the deep basin um, offshore of the West Greenland shelf. And here we have a whole huge land system model in that case. So those are the scales that I want to try and look at in this talk. But let's look at some individual landforms first. And I would say 
In terms of glaciers, there are three types of landform. One are subglacially produced landforms. The second are ice marginal landforms produced at the terminus, the, grounded, the grounding line of glaciers and ice sheets. And the third are those beyond the ice itself in the marine realm. And we've got a whole series of streamlined subglacial landforms. The scale, both in terms of bath bathymetry and in terms of distance, is given in each case. We can see streamlined landforms in the direction of past ice flow, just a few meters high and spaced a couple of hundred meters apart. And those, oops, those are produced characteristically at the base of fast flowing glaciers, fast flowing glaciers and ice streams. And indeed, where glaciologists have looked using geophysical tools at the base of, for example, the active Rutford ice stream in Antarctica, the same features are actually imaged. They're formed of deformable glacial sediments under high water pressure, which is, of course, the mechanism by which ice streams flow fast. We can see them buried beneath the sea surface as well as on the sea surface if we look at 3D seismic records and look at paleo shelves within them. And then we have transitional landforms, which have got streamlined sedimentary tails and bedrock cores at their upflow end, and these traditionally are called crag and tails. We've got some glacier tectonic landforms. In this case, the direction of ice flow is like this. Freezing freezes on basal sediments, which are then thawed out, melted, and dropped a few kilometers, a kilometer or two off, and these are called hill hole pairs. Then, where ice during stagnation sits down on the sedimentary sea floor and where basal water pressures are lowered, we get squeezing of this mobile deformable debris into crevasses to form this beautiful sort of boxwork structure, which is very delicate. And then, of course, we get channel systems and sedimentary eskers, which represent the subglacial hydrological system. And then, if we look secondly at ice marginal landforms, we see, for example, the huge shield riggen terminal moraine west of Norway, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, we see hummocky terrain at the ice edge, and we see moraine ridges of all sorts of shapes. These are very delicate, again, just a few meters high, spaced couple of hundred meters apart, and these are formed transverse to flow. So they're formed, in this case, by ice retreat across a continental shelf, and the ice retreats, as it is in most parts of the icy world, during summer. In winter, sea ice forms, and the ice undergoes a small re-advance because iceberg production is suppressed. So if you like, what is happening to form these is during the summer, melting takes place, icebergs are carved, and the ice front retreats, whereas during winter, there's a small re-advance which pushes up these little moraines. So it's, if you like, three or four steps back, half a step forward, three or four steps back, half a step forward. And we can actually count these back year on year in some Svalbard fjords over the last century or so. So they're very good chronologically. And then, of course, we've got very large sedimentary systems produced at the margins of fast-flowing former ice streams. One of the most famous is the Bear Island Trough Mouth Fan, um, which contains several hundred thousand cubic kilometers of material and covers a vast area um, with outward bulging contours on the, on the Barents Sea margin. Similarly, grounding zone wedges, which are formed during ice stream retreat, the retreat of active ice in ice streams, and they can be 100 meters thick in terms of their sediments. So those are all formed at the ice margin. And then beyond the ice edge itself, we find firstly that sometimes the topography is buried by the rain out of material that is derived where we have an active subglacial hydrological system from the rain out of turbid suspended sediment, which has come from the base of the glacier, um, has flowed out as a turbid plume, and then rains out to cover with very fine grained debris the existing topography and to fill many of the basins in, for example, the fjords of Svalbard. And then we have beautiful iceberg plow marks at all sorts of scales and shapes, but we can observe those not only at the surface, but again, on paleo surfaces, buried surfaces, up to a kilometre or so deep, um, which are useful indicators of the inception of glaciation. If we take the um, mid-Norwegian shelf, for example, um, or the area around the North Sea, we can find these iceberg plow marks buried up to a kilometre or over two million years old beneath the modern seafloor in those areas, indicating directly, rather than using iceberg rafting in distal 
ODP cores, we can show very directly that that sediment package is associated with ice. And of course, we just shouldn't neglect the stratigraphy of these things, and we can look at all sorts of scales of stratigraphy, from shallow, high-resolution acoustic stratigraphy to conventional two and then 3D seismics. We can see grounding zone wedges, such as the one I showed before. This one is about 20 meters thick. This is a profile through one of them, and here is one buried beneath over 100 meters of sediments, um, in this case, on the Northwest Greenland shelf. At much higher resolution, we look at the megascale glacial lineations, the streamline features produced from beneath um, ice streams, and they're now the features are coming out of the board towards you. And this is a cross section through them. And we can see that this deformable till in which they're formed under high water pressure is uh, maybe a few meters to about 10 meters in depth. Similarly, on the Bear Island fan, if we look into it, we find a lot of lenticular lobes representing debris flows cascading down the slope intermittently, which are the building blocks of trough mouth fans. And again, built from this deforming sediment, delivered rapidly to the ice edge by fast flowing glaciers and ice sheets. And on the other hand, this is an acoustic example of the basin fill that is formed by the rain out of um, material from turbid suspended sediment plumes. So we not only look at the landforms in plan, we look at them in various ways in cross section. And when we put all that back together, we get spectacular features such as this Malam's Yuppet cross shelf trough. Um, this is from the wonderful Mariano data set that the Norwegian Geological Survey and others have worked so hard to collect and the hydrographic service have worked so hard to collect over many years. You can see here and note the scale. So this is about 30 kilometers. You can see the trough mouth fan at the edge of the cross shelf trough. You can see the streamlined lineations in the direction of past ice flow. You can see a grounding zone wedge, a sedimentary wedge, which is built up during a still stand during retreat from full glacial conditions when ice was at the shelf edge. And then we can see transitional forms between streamlined bedrock and the sedimentary cross shelf trough material itself. And also at the margins of that cross shelf trough, we see lateral moraines associated with the shear zone between fast and slow flowing ice under full glacial conditions. This is an ice stream land system. What happens in between? This is an inter ice stream land system because we know at all scales, whether it's the uh, ice caps of Franz Josef Land and Seven Eyers Emilia in the Russian Arctic or the Antarctic ice sheet, all, ice, all large ice masses seem to break down into fast flowing ice streams and, inter and intermittent slower flowing pieces between. And this is the land, land system between two ice streams on the mid Norwegian shelf. It's just off uh, the Lofoten Islands, and there's a big ice stream coming down here, another one coming out there. And here we find um, not the streamlines in the direction of ice flow that we saw before, but rather transverse to flow ridges and hum associated hummocky terrain and a series of retreat ridges just here. Um, and also a lot of iceberg plow marks um, in these shallower waters. And typically we would expect ice flow to be slow under full glacial conditions in these inter ice stream areas. And that is why we get the production of smaller features built up over longer periods transverse to flow. And we can look at the Svalbard archipelago as an example of utilizing these data to map the presence of past ice streams through the streamlined in the direction of flow features and the inter ice stream areas in between. And the area just here is a very nice example of an inter ice stream area because most of the ice from the Svalbard ice dome under full glacial conditions was going out through the major fjord systems. And this therefore was fed by a rather smaller glaciological drainage basin, which means that the amount of ice was not sufficient to generate fast ice flow in this area. So we have a classical inter-ice stream landform assemblage in situations like this. So we can conceptualize this again into landform assemblages for ice streams and for inter-ice stream areas. And then we can apply that to both the quaternary and the deep ice, ice age record through geological time. And we can see that Ice streams are typically associated with linear features streamlined in the direction of former ice flow with occasional large retreat features associated with still stands during retreat, often associated with shallowing, and therefore the, the, the 
constraining of iceberg carving at certain points. And these, we think, have built up over perhaps a decade to centuries during retreat. But all the time, because you see the streamlined features uh, are both outside the wedges and overprint the wedges, all the time the ice is still flowing fast, even during retreat. That's why you can build a big depot centre, because this is built from um, the deforming sediments. Whereas in our inter-ice stream assemblage, we've got slower retreat of grounded ice margins in shallower water, and we've got landforms, the submarine landforms, that are typically transverse to flow. So there's quite a big contrast between these two types of landform assemblage associated with fast and slow glacier flow. There's also a surging glacier system um, associated with ice ending in the sea. And this is some work that we've just had published this year in marine geology, um, which is actually an open marine land system for surge type glaciers. You can see some 1930s photographs of these two glaciers. There's one of the glaciers there, that's this one just here. And you can see the moraine systems marking the maximum ice extent at about that period, the 30s, perhaps a little bit before, maybe, maybe early 20th century. And you can see, again, the streamlines um, during fast, the, the rapid advance phase of the surge, the build-up of a moraine, terminal moraine system with debris flows beyond reflecting the, the rapid delivery of soft sediments. And then during retreat and stagnation, we can see very small retreat moraines formed in this beautiful pattern as ice retreats to its present condition. And again, we can come up with an assemblage model for this because, of course, it's important in the geological record to recognise when we are dealing with surge-type glaciers because they are not directly, although they are indirectly, but not directly influenced by climate, but more directly influenced by internal instabilities within their hydrological system. So if we want to distinguish between surge-type glaciers that have advanced and retreated and glaciers that are advancing and retreating due to climatic stimuli, then we need to know this kind of landform assemblage, and this gives us the ability to recognise it in the paleo record. So... I said that we could also, as well as dealing with the variety of landforms, which I've just talked about, we can use these landforms to map ice sheet extent and initiation. So here's a map of the Greenland ice sheet, and you can see, I want you to focus on northeast Greenland. The conventional wisdom 10 or 20 years ago was that northeast Greenland shelf, which extends about 300 kilometres beyond the outer coast, hadn't been glaciated at the Lake Wyxillian at maximum. That was the traditional view, because it's already really cold there. If you just make it colder, it's probably going to be drier. So where is the ice source to build the ice sheet out? Well, you can look at the marine geological record. And of course, this is a hard place to get to. Not many ships have been onto this shelf, because still, it is very heavily ice infested through ice coming out of the Arctic Ocean and through the, in, in the East Greenland current out of the, east, the west side of Fram Strait. We managed to get the British research vessel on there, and this is what we saw. A whole series of very clearly defined megascale glacial lineations, and here are more, here and here. And what this showed instantly is that the Greenland ice sheet, we've got some dates here too, the Greenland ice sheet at the last glacial maximum had actually extended across the shelf and likely reached the shelf edge even offshore of northeast North Greenland. So a very simple observation, but a very powerful one, which completely rewrites the meteorology of that part of Greenland and the glaciology of that part of Greenland at the last glacial maximum. And then we can look back through the whole of the quaternary from 3D seismic data sets, and this is work I've done with Dag Ottesen from the Norwegian Geological Survey, and there we can find paleo-buried iceberg plow marks right back to 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 million years in the sedimentary package of the, North, the, the, the northern North Sea Basin. And this, of course, indicates that ice must have been at sea level and carving quite large icebergs very early in the quaternary. And this, as I said before, is direct evidence of the action of ice and glaciers rather than the more indirect evidence that one would get from iceberg rafting in the deep Norwegian Greenland Sea further offshore. And what can we say then about ice sheet flow dynamics? Here is 
a big swath mosaic collected and put together over about five years from three major geophysical cruises to the Marguerite Bay cross-shelf trough on the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, the trough is about 350 kilometres long, something like that, about 30 kilometres wide. This is an oblique view, so it's not completely to scale. And what we see is beautiful megascale glacial lineations indicating that an ice stream operated in this cross-shelf trough. Um, at the last glacial maximum, and probably during early deglaciation too. Further in, we can see some wedges of sediment indicating um, intermittent ice still stands during retreat, often associated with shallowing and therefore the lessening of mass loss through carving. And up on the banks in between, you, know, you just make it out at this scale, there is a huge amount of iceberg ploughing of the primary landforms produced subglacially. And so the, shelf rec the, the shallow bank record is much harder to reconstruct than the trough record because the trough record is often below the keels of the deepest icebergs. Here we're about 600 metres deep. And in fact, as you see these streamlined subglacial landforms disappearing about here, that blurring, although you can't really see it at this scale, is due to icebergs down to about 500, 480, 500 metres, ploughing the seafloor, and there's a sharp cutoff uh, about that, that water depth um, where ploughing has actually destroyed much of the record. And then, of course, sediments are deposited from the fast-flowing ice stream onto the continental slope beyond. Now, when we came down here to Antarctica, after having worked a lot together with many Norwegian colleagues around Greenland and around the Barents Sea and the, Nor and the Greenland Sea area, we expect fast-flowing ice streams to deliver lots of sediments to these margins and therefore to build trough mouth fans, like the Bear Island fan, like the Storfjorden fan, like the Isfjorden fan, all of those. There isn't one here. There's a bit of a depot centre, but it's not a huge one. But what we see is a lot of gullies and some submarine channels. And they are actually taking sediment delivered under full glacial conditions. They're taking sediment from the upper slope. Sediment is failing on the upper slope and going down as turbidity currents through, through well-formed turbidity current channels and actually being deposited in abyssal depths much further offshore. Why is that the case here? It's so because the, Antarctic, the western margin of the Ant Antarctic Peninsula, for tectonic reasons, for longer-term tectonic reasons, is actually much steeper than the passive margin of Norway Barents margin. And therefore, at slopes of 7, 8, 10 degrees, rather than a half to 2 or 3 degrees, we find sediment failure and bypassing taking place on the upper slope. The processes of delivery are exactly the same as for the north, but the slope is steeper, so we get a different landform offshore on the continental slope and beyond. Then some of the major features we see around the whole of the Arctic are firstly cross-shelf troughs in red here. And there are many of them which we've mapped out. And then beyond them on the continental slope in orange, the large the Bear Island fan is the largest, the large trough mouth fans. And we've worked on the Scoresby Sun fan and one or two others. And the ones I would like to go to, Yonova says I've worked in Russia, which I have on the glaciers and ice caps, but I should love to get there to work on these very large fan systems too. But we've so far failed to be able to do that. And so, if we map out these landforms, these submarine glacial landforms which are indicative of past fast glacier flow, we can actually then, for the whole 2,000 kilometres between the Norwegian Channel and Shetland down here, and north of Svalbard, right into the Kvitoya area and the Franz Victoria Trough, we can then, using the mapping of these landforms, show where the fast flowing ice streams are, in the grey with the arrows, and where the intertrough the shallower banks with slower moving ice are present. And of course, this is interesting in its own right, and it's a very large area to be able to do that over, but what this then provides is a very simple but very ro robust test of ice sheet numerical models trying to predict the behavior of ice at the last glacial maximum and during retreat. If those models 
cannot predict the positions of past ice streams. And remember that ice streams drain 50 to 80% of the interior of the great ice sheets and most of the large ice caps of the Arctic. If we can't do that, our model has very little chance of actually predicting how sea level rise will take place over the next century. We need to know how these fast-flowing filaments are actually behaving. This is an early model um, that Martin Seeger and I produced um, um, early in the 2000s. And we, we can see that this model, to some extent, fits the margin of the ice sheet defined from the, the geological record. But you can see there are no ice streams in it at all. Now, the challenge for, for the modeling community, of course, which they have taken up, is to refine greatly the resolution of the numerical models and also to try and work with the basal boundary condition and also the boundary condition between the ice and the ocean, the grounding zone. And that, those are the great challenges for ice sheet modeling today. And the aim is to be able to reproduce for models of the last glacial, say from 30,000 to 10,000, a pattern that is much more like this. It's a very simple but robust test of ice sheet numerical models. We know, and this is Antarctica and Greenland at the same scale, we know that these great ice sheets break down into fast flowing elements in the purples and the yellows and so on. And here are some huge ice streams draining back hundreds of kilometers into the East Antarctic ice sheet, the classical ice streams of the Sipal coast area of West Antarctica. And the biggest, the biggest one in Greenland, the Northeast Greenland ice stream, Jakobshavn Ispray, is just here. These are classical ice streams separated by inter-ice stream areas in modern ice sheets. But we can go further back in time, and where we have good exposure, which is the case for a lot of the late Ordovician rocks in northern Africa, some of them are well exposed. Others have been extensively studied using 3D seismic because these are oil and gas traps. We can use the same knowledge of cross-shelf troughs, of megascale glacial lineations, large moraines, and so on, and major grounding zones, in order to try and start to reproduce along this 4,000 kilometer margin of the African ice sheet about 450 million years ago, we can start to map out the positions of cross-shelf troughs and streamline features. And in fact, they break down to about six or seven on this northern margin of the African ice sheet. Um, and we've actually undertaken a series of very simple model calculations to show what sort of paleo precipitation levels you need, because if you have too low precipitation, you actually run out of ice to charge these things. So we can do all sorts of nice little experiments to see whether this is a plausible reconstruction. So we can move from the observation of outcrop and sometimes satellite imagery of paleo surfaces and 3D seismic surfaces to the provisional mapping of these ice streams 450 million years ago, and then to try to test them against glaciological reconstructions too. So we can go far back in time with this method. We can also look at the style and the rate of ice sheet deglacial retreat. Ice was at the shelf edge over most of Greenland, Norway, um, and Antarctica at the last glacial maximum. How did it retreat? Did it do the same thing each time? We can take a series of observations and make inferences about differences in retreat rates. The observation here is of very well-preserved streamlined landforms. This is our old friend now, Marguerite Bay in Antarctica. This is a blow-up of what you saw before, and you can see the lineations very, very nicely here. Deglaciation, deglaciation here was about 13 or 14,000 years ago. These are beautifully preserved with just about a half a meter of Holocene drape on the top of them. What does it indicate? We interpret this to be a signal of rapid liftoff and ice retreat. When during early deglaciation, the ice sheet was thinning and sea level was rising quite dramatically globally. The ice therefore became unpinned from the bed and retreated rapidly because there's nothing on the top of this except iceberg plow marks and a bit of Holocene drape. So observation, very well preserved streamlined landforms, interpretation, rapid liftoff, rapid retreat. This is Vestfjord, Vestfjorden, North Norway, the Lofoten's just up here. Here, by contrast, we can see series of stream oops, series of streamlined landforms, but also grounding zone wedges depot centers that probably formed over decades to centuries during ice retreat up the 150 or so kilometers 
of Vestfjorden. And here we can see that the ice was active even during the formation of these grounding zone wedges because they've got streamlines on the top. That's how you build a big wedge because you've got to have the, the velocity, you've got to have the motion in order to get the deforming sediments to the ice edge. But these grounding zone wedges are separated um, by areas which indicate rapid retreat. So we say that where we've got grounding zone wedges superimposed on these lineations, it indicates episodic retreat from one pinning point to another, probably quite rapid between. And then a third set of observations, and this is from Belsund um, in Spitsbergen, and the ice flow direction would have been like this, and the shelf edge is somewhere over to the left, just here. Here, we see a series of very delicate transverse to flow retreat moraine ridges just a few meters high and pace, spaced very close together. This indicates the slow retreat of a grounded ice margin. Um, and so we've got then three different things to look at here. We've got our lineations, very well preserved, nothing on the top of them, which indicate rapid retreat, lift off, rapid retreat. Episodic retreat, where there are still stands of decades to centuries during retreat, often associated with shallowing water. And then where we've got the slow retreat of a grounded ice margin, and in some places in Antarctica we find thousands of these, one behind the other, indicating slow retreat of a part of the ice sheet. And so, again, this is a different but robust and simple test of ice sheet numerical models. Can ice sheet numerical models move sensibly through full glacial to deglacial to Holocene conditions? And can we, around Antarctica or Greenland, for example, work out where rapid, episodic, and slow retreat took place? And can the numerical models do this? Well, the answer, of course, again, is that they can't because their boundary conditions, their understanding of the ice bed interface is not sufficient. But this, again, is a new challenge to the ice sheet modeling community, which they are rising to. We have people in the Scott Polar Research Institute. There may well be people here, too, who are tackling these sorts of problems. And then, as I mentioned at the start, what are the dimensions and what are the rates of development of these submarine glacial landforms. Well, this is a diagram which puts together most of the different kinds of individual submarine glacial landforms and has time on this axis, note it's a log scale, and volume on this axis. So we find the tiniest features which are formed quasi-instantaneously or over a few hours. And those ones, if you look at the purple, are iceberg grounding berms. So as an iceberg um, on uh, 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 in, a, in a current would drift where it impinges upon the seafloor, it pushes up a berm. These are small features in volume and they take and they're built very, very quickly. At the other end of the scale, which is nine orders of magnitude bigger, we've got the great trough mouth fans fed from full glacial and deglacial ice streams, which cause bulging out of the contours on whole continental margins. And all you've got to do is look at the Jeb Jebco or the Ibco um, bathymetry of the Arctic to see roughly where those enormous depot centers of which the Bear Island fan is one of the biggest are placed. And then in between, we've got various other features. You can see some of the smaller ones. These ones here are little mega scale glacial lineations. Um, and then we've got grounding zone wedges, which are larger, and those may be formed over decades to centuries. So we're beginning to be able to put these landforms in a temporal context. What I would say, because this is not a solved problem, is that we're a bit better on the volumes than we are at the timescales at the moment. And that's actually because a lot of this material is diamictic. There isn't much datable material in it. So the dating of this, is the, and even the bracketing, of it is sometimes difficult. But we do our best. This is work that I've been doing with the British Antarctic Survey, Rob Larter and others. And here, we've identified a grounding zone on the margin of the Antarctic Peninsula. And what we're doing, it with, with, what we're doing with it is putting a whole series of cores through it and trying to bracket the time that material was deposited here with the time material was deposited here and here to try and work out whether it's really decades or whether it's centuries that these features, which are sometimes a couple of hundred meters thick, take to build up during retreat from full glacial conditions uh, across the shelf. The other way that you can do this, which we and others have tried to do, 
is there is a limited amount of data available from the observation, geophysical observation, of the behaviour of modern ice streams and one or two boreholes which have recorded subglacial sediment velocities and fluxes through that. And we've tried to work out for a given volume and what we know, what little we know, about the fluxes of debris at the base of ice streams, how they match up. And again, our sense is that we're looking at a few hundred years for the bigger features of this sort, taking that different approach to working out what, is, what, what, what the time period is for them to build up. And then what, what could we say about, sorry, what can we say about the basal hydrological system of glaciers? Because the problem is here that hydrology is very, very critical to ice sheet and ice stream flow, but most of it's buried under thousands of metres of ice in the modern environment, and yet we have a well-preserved paleo record, which is a window onto that. So, let's go back a bit and say this is the Ostferner ice cap, which both Jan Uwe, a number of colleagues in this room, and I have worked on in the past glaciologically. But we can also use sequential satellite imagery to map the points round the margin of Ostferner, and this is about a 200 kilometer long stretch of ice cliffs, the longest in the Northern Hemisphere. And we can plot out the positions of turbid suspended sediment plumes, which come from point sources of subglacial streams where they reach the edge of the ice. And we can map these, not just instantly, but over a number of tens of years, and we can map their positions. We can also model numerically what is the likely configuration of the basal hydrological system of the Ostferner ice cap, and we can then start to match up the bigger areas where it looks like streams are flowing with those observations of where the plumes are. So this is another example, and this is what we try to do all the time, is to mesh numerical modelling work with observational data, in this case from satellite imagery. And we can also work out paleofluxes and how long, therefore, and at what distance, sedimentation from suspended sediments, very, from, from cobbles very close to the, the mouths of these subglacial streams as they come to the edge of the ice, and more distally, um, the suspended sediments that come from them. Now, we can also, for Ostferner, say that actually the ice margin has not been stable for any long length of time since satellite imagery began. And the mean rate of ice margin change, ice margin retreat, is around about 40 or 50 metres a year. It's slightly episodic, but you can see that all these parts of the ice cap have retreated fairly systematically, partly through surging retreat and partly through um, the end of the Little Ice Age. So the ice terminus has not been stable. And then we can move on and look at the marine geological record and say, right, if we have a stable ice margin over a period of perhaps decades, we would expect a nice little fan, a nice ice proximal fan. Cobbles up here, fining with distance offshore to be produced. Now, this is a classic model that appears in every textbook that you will read on glacial geology and the ice the, the grounded ice interface with the ocean. How many do we find in places like Svalbard, in places like Greenland? Almost none. I can count them on one hand, and yet they're in all the textbooks. That's what everybody expects to find. Why don't we find them? I think we don't find them because ice in almost every part of the marine realm has actually been retreating over at least the last century, and therefore the ice front is not in a position uh, a stable position for long enough to actually build one of those fans, given the rate of sediment delivery. So what we get is lots of little blobs which are associated with the ice when it was at this position, but then by the next year it's retreated, by the year after it's ret retreated again, and there simply isn't the flux per unit time to build what we would call these classical ice proximal fans with which the literature would lead us to believe we should see all the time. And then, as a further detail, if we have ice re-advance at any point, perhaps due to surging, we would get some sort of tectonization of those fans. So we've got a whole series of different scenarios. Stable ice margin, allowing enough years or decades for ice to put together a nice fan. A retreating margin where we just get little blobs of sediment, um, sorted sediments, and tectoni tectonization where we actually have um, small re-advances. And this 
offshore of Ostferner, because we've also done the, the swath bathymetry offshore, these little blobs here are effectively these in the model. So we think that we've verified that through the marine geological record. And that means we can infer whether we've got stable or retreating tidewater glacier margins from the marine record. And interestingly, if we go to Alaska, southeast Alaska, where there's much more mass throughput from very high mountains and very high precipitation rates, and therefore much more sediment delivery on softer sediments as well, um, much more erosion, much more sediment delivery, we can actually find some of these little ice proximal fans offshore of Alaska, Alaskan glaciers, even though they're also retreating rapidly, because the rate of sediment delivery from the streams is so much greater, at least one and possibly two orders of magnitude greater than Svalbard, that we actually get them there. And of course, it's no coincidence that all the textbook examples are actually from Alaska. And that's conversely why we don't find them in Svalbard. The sedimentation, sediment delivery rates are lower and the rate of retreat is quite high. And then we can take this sort of knowledge again back to the beautiful outcrops in the late Ordovician rocks of Algeria and Libya in Africa. And we can see then in wonderful outcrop, rather than having to look at this sort of um, fining sequence and ice proximal fans um, geophysically and with the odd core from a ship poked through it, we can actually identify paleo features like this, at the margins of former glaciers very well exposed in the northern Sahara Desert, and we can pull out the sedimentary fascias absolutely beautifully from these. So again, not only do we move between observation and modelling, we also move through time from modern environments to quaternary environments through to ice ages through geological time. And then we can use techie things as well. We can go with ROVs and even AUVs onto the seafloor, and we, we've been into some of the meltwater, the huge meltwater channels in, incised into bedrock, sometimes 50 metres deep, tens of metres wide, in Antarctica. And we can show through photography of the bases or near bases of these channels that they are actually potholed and therefore they are produced by water under high pressure. We can look at their long profiles on swath bathymetry and we can say, unlike normal rivers, those profiles go up and down. So they are formed by water under high pressure in subglacial channels. Probably episodic filling of those channels with water only, because if we calculate um, from the vast interior basins, given the likely geothermal heat fluxes and the likely strain heating fluxes, we get simply a dribble if meltwater flow is continuous. And you actually need the storage of water in subglacial lakes, which of course have been imaged in Antarctica, and then the intermittent drainage of those to provide anything like the amount of water to fill or even partially fill these huge channels. So this is starting to give us a window on the subglacial hydrological system. Then we go back again to our old friend Marguerite Bay. We look at our mega, mega scale glacial lineations on the outer shelf and we say, well, you know, we've just looked at Svalbard. There's lots of streams coming to the ice margin there. Here, there is no evidence of any channelised water flow whatsoever. And you go in vast areas of Svalbard, and particularly Antarctica and Greenland, and you find very little evidence of channelised water flow on the outer shelf. The inner shelf, you see a lot cut into bedrock. On the outer shelf, you see very little, very little sorted sediment. This is all diametric. And what we think is happening here is that water on the outer shelf is actually moving and responsible for, under high water pressure, the motion of the deforming tills that gives the speed to the fast-flowing ice streams. And that is our explanation for why we don't typically find meltwater streams on the outer shelf. And we can look in detail at these megascale lineations and we can see again that these are streamline features coming out towards us rather than having any particular meltwater signature. We can also then map out, I'll just come back to that one, we can also map out because this strong reflector is the base of that deforming sediment. We can map that out over six or 7,000 square kilometres of that paleo ice sheet outer margin. And this diagram is the deformation till thickness over the whole area 
of that, at the outer shelf of that, cross, of, the, of that cross shelf trough and that paleo ice stream. And this again is a very good example of how we can use the well preserved paleo record, and this time the acoustic record, in order to reconstruct the thickness of deforming till over under vast areas of this paleo ice sheet. That is very, very difficult, very expensive, and only has been done in a very few places using seismics at the, at the margins of modern. Antarctic glaciers. And we can also look at latitudinal transects between different land systems. These have been mapped for Marguerite Bay at 69 south, Pine Island Bay for 74 degrees south. We've got the evidence at the top of the landform mapping from swath bathymetry, and we've got these huge land system models to show. And in fact, they're actually rather similar. They show meltwater channels incised into bedrock on the inner shelf, and they show predominantly sediment deformation on the outer shelf. Um, and the presence of ice streams, again, with grounding zone wedges showing episodic retreat on the outer shelf. We can go to the coldest parts of Antarctica as well, the Pritz Bay, Terra Daly margins of East Antarctica. Here, even today, although many, many icebergs are carved from these, these areas, um, the sediment from those icebergs bypasses the inner shelf because the water is about minus one, minus one and a half degrees centigrade and very little melting takes place. Whereas if we go to Scotland, um, this is the Minch ice stream right at the southern margins of the um, Eurasian ice sheet at the last full glacial. Uh, we find that we can see somewhat more evidence of fast glacier flow and the presence of some meltwater. So, we can use this to reconstruct past environmental conditions. Here are four satellite images. Southeast Alaska, which is the warmest place in the northern hemisphere where ice reaches the sea today. And here, we can see the snow line, the darker area of bare ice during summer. And we can see these peas are suspended sediment plumes of meltwater. If we go to Svalbard, here is the snow line on the west side of Ostferna. There are also suspended sediment plumes. But if we go to the much colder environments of northeast Greenland and East Antarctica, the area that I was just talking about, the George V the, George the land, a daily coast, we can see that the production of icebergs rather than the delivery of sediments by meltwater actually dominates in these areas. And in particular, in East Antarctica, look at the scale. Large numbers of icebergs, there are a lot of them dotted around here, are being produced. Um, that you can see some of them very nicely showing in the sea ice here. And what we're really seeing here is an environmental gradient in the nature of the ice interface with the ocean. The warmest in places like Chile in the southern hemisphere and southeast Alaska in the northern hemisphere, through Svalbard and Baffin Island, which are intermediate environments, through to the coldest part of the planet today at the ice ocean interface, East Antarctica. And we find progressively less sorted sediment as we get colder because there's less meltwater and the predominance of iceberg delivery of debris is much more important. We can look, too, at evidence latitudinally for the presence of meltwater. So here in the quaternary of the North Sea, there are very many large drainage systems known as tunnel valleys in the North Sea. We're finding them further north now in the Barents Sea, and some very good work by the Tromso Group has shown this. Um, they are everywhere in the North Sea, indicating a huge amount of meltwater, and I think also probably stagnant ice in the North Sea, so that the meltwater channels have time to be cut. And then if we go to 75 north in the Barents Sea, this is work by Bjorn Dottir and others, which is, uh, we, um, they are now at the Norwegian Geological Survey. There we find grounding zone wedges, which are formed by the delivery of soft basal sediments, together with actually some evidence of grounding line fans. So here we're saying there's not only an imprint from the delivery of deforming sediment, but there's also some sorting related to meltwater. So under full glacial conditions, the Barents Sea, uh, certainly during retreat, is actually an area of significant meltwater. If we look, though, on very high latitude shelves in places like northeast and northwest Greenland, um, in particular, we find that the area is dominated not by meltwater systems, but actually by grounding zone wedges, indicating that meltwater is a less important component of the system at these high and cold latitudes, as we would expect. But even in Antarctica, 
If we look carefully at grounding zone wedges, this big grounding zone wedge offshore of East Africa has a breach. Oh, all right, that's okay. Has, has a breach point which um, is associated with meltwater. And if we look um, at a cross section, a strike line through this grounding zone wedge in northwest Greenland, we can see there is some evidence, for example, here of little channels in it. So perhaps at very high resolution, there's a little bit more evidence of meltwater than we first thought. And we can take our notion of a continuum of glacial marine environments from warmest to coldest today in a quaternary interglacial, and we can take that to quaternary full glacial conditions. And of course, what happens then is everything moves to the right. So Patagonia, which is today the limit of where ice reaches the sea, where we have tidewater glaciers, is now superseded as the lowest latitude where ice reaches the sea under full glacial th conditions. We've got the southwest British Isles, the Isles of Scilly, southwest Ireland, the whole Norwegian margin, the Gulf of Maine, and even New Zealand glaciers, very warm conditions, just about making it to sea. So we can use this model and we can extend it back because everything moves to the right during full glacials. And then we find that sorting, ice proximal fans, tunnel valleys, eskers indicate milder environments, this side of the, the diagram, whereas diamictic material is more typical of the colder elements. We can also do numerical modelling of this. I, I won't go into too much detail on this, but this is numerical modelling of mass loss by meltwater and iceberg production with latitude. Here's the Eurasian ice sheet. If we take A to B, that's just here, and we can see that southwest of Ireland and the western British margin, melting is shown to be the dominant form of mass loss, um, whereas if we go further, and carving is limited, whereas as we go further north, carving of icebergs becomes progressively more important. So we can show not only by our observation of landforms, but in this case, supported by modelling, that meltwater becomes less important and iceberg production becomes more important as we go to colder latitudes. We can also use grounding zone wedges as indicators of past ice shelves because they are formed at the interface between the ice and the ocean. The reason they've got fairly sub subdued topography at the surface, or when buried, is because they fill limited accommodation space beneath floating ice shelves. Now, rather naughtily, we all draw the grounding zone as being something like this. We say, right, the ice is grounded here, and then all of a sudden, it goes up like that. In fact, real grounding zones, and a few have been observed, they're tiny, tiny gaps. And as the tide goes up and down, the ice sits down, comes up again, sits down and comes up again. And these grounding zones with t these tiny little gaps with very, very limited accommod vertical accommodation space um, can go for several kilometres. So this caricature is not a good diagram. And the real grounding zone is an area of very limited vertical accommodation space, which explains the subdued nature of these very large features. But modern ice shelves, and we can show this from satellite imagery and meteorological data very nicely, are restricted to environments that are colder than five degrees since the, the mi uh, that's unfortunate colder than minus five degrees that, that minus should come there colder than minus five degrees in air temperature in Antarctica so where we find grounding zone wedges in the paleo record we are able to say that conditions are colder than minus five degrees centigrade in mean annual temperature and finally the complexity of ice sheet behavior and flow reorganization. Many of you will be familiar with 3D seismic data collection from rather weird looking ships like this. We've worked with a lot of seismic cubes together with colleagues in the Norwegian Geolo Geological Survey and NTNU, looking deep into the quaternary record. And all these are buried surfaces with mega scale glacial lineations um, that you can see in those images. I want to show you some examples from the Naust Formation. This is the quaternary sediment package offshore of Norway, and that's the transect there from near the coast to the continental slope as it stands at the moment west of Norway. And what we can see is this dark blue reflector is the base of the Naust Formation. It's the base of the quaternary. So coming back to our iceberg plow marks, we find them right down here at the very base of the quaternary 2.5 or so million years ago. But what is interesting about the stratigraphy here is as the ice 
advances across the continental shelf in successive full glacial periods, it actually builds out the continental shelf. And the continental shelf is now 100 or more kilometres further west than it was at the beginning of the Quaternary. Each time, ice goes across a shelf and down the continental slope. So we have what are called these clinoforms of paleo shelf, paleo slope, paleo shelf, paleo slope. In some cases, the paleo shelves are preserved. In other cases, you can see the truncation of the paleocontinental slopes. They're erased by the action of subsequent glacial erosion. So where we want to look for the story of past glaciations and past continental shelves and past ice dynamics is actually on those preserved continental shelves, which run back right the way through the Quaternary. We can see a great example of flow switching here over the period from the Salian, which is reflected in the red lines, and the Weichselian, which is reflected in the white lines. There are one, two, three, four 3D seismic cubes here. We can look at the direction, the orientation of these megascale streamlined glacial lineations in each, and we can see that in the Salian, 140,000 years ago, the ice was flowing in this direction, whereas in the Weichselian, it decided to turn 90 degrees and actually flow out at what is now Trenny Uppert. We interpret this firstly to indicate very major flow switching of between 100 and 150 kilometers between different glacial periods. And our preliminary interpretation of what is going on is the accommodation space here was filled during, with sediment during the Salian, and therefore it became easier for the ice to flow in this direction rather than this direction during the subsequent Weichselian glaciation. But we can take this a stage further. Um, with one of my students and people at NGU and NTNU, we can go back through the whole Quaternary, and there are 20 something paleo surfaces that we can look at. We can look at the, sediment, the rate of sediment delivery between each of those through the whole of the Quaternary, and we can also look at the paleo continental shelf surfaces, and we can actually map right through the Quaternary with N being the oldest um, paleo surfaces and T being the most recent paleo surfaces. And using landform, landforms identified on these paleo surfaces, we can actually reconstruct the action of ice streams cutting cross shelf troughs and delivering sediment to form major depot centers right throughout the Quaternary. And what we show here is from about seven or 800,000 years ago, there seems to be an intensification of glaciation, the cutting of major cross shelf troughs, um, which is associated with that change from the 40,000 to the 100,000 year periodicity, which is known as the intensification of glaciation across the icy world. And this is very nice sedimentary confirmation of exactly that. So, to conclude, I hope I've shown you the, some of the variety of subglacial landforms, what they look like, some of the things that we can extract from those landforms in terms of ice extent, and aspects of their dynamics, including deglacial retreat style. But we need to know more about processes and rates. We need to know more about basal hydrology. And certainly, we are only just beginning with high resolution tools to tackle the complexity of change. But it is certain, as with most things in science, the closer we look, the better the tools that we have, the more complicated the picture that is revealed of the behavior of past ice sheets. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. I see that you have a lot of papers when you look at the enormous amount of data you have. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Do we have a one quick question, maybe, before we... Yeah, Torben. You talked about the grounding zone wedges. Are there any other submarine landforms that are specific for uh, floating ice margins? And if so, do you see any of those around Svalbard? No, the, the problem with floating ice is that once it's lifted off, there's not much of a record. Um, and one of the, the things that is interesting about grounding zone wedges is this shows us, because I think the, accommodate, the vertical accommodation space is limited, where we have a grounding zone and an ice shelf beyond. But it is much more difficult to tell whether that ice shelf is 5 or 50 kilometres wide. And one way in which you can begin to do this, and people were doing this 30 or 40 years ago, although they didn't quite realize, I think, the full implications of what they were doing, 
is to look at the micropel in places like Davis Strait and Baffin Bay and to say, what is the configuration and what are the environments in which these micro beasts like to live? And they don't like to live beneath floating ice shelves. And therefore, I think the micropel is as well a clue. And some of the, the distal sedimentary fascias are, are also a clue. But it's the sedimentology rather than the morphology that I think is the key clue in this case. But it's not easy to do, I would say. OK, thank you. I think we have to stop there. But before I hand over a small gift for Julian, I invite you all to have a little bit to eat and drink immediately after this, so you can also approach both speakers there, I suppose. I see they're both still here. So, Julian, please. This is uh, Geoscience oh, Atlas of Svalbard. Yeah. I don't know if I, you already I got that. I or don't, not. I don't know. Oh, you no. go. You thank don't. You, Good. Thank you very much. So, please. That's lovely. It's the most recent publication from Svalbard on, on that scale. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.